Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the April 1st, 2021 COVID-19 Mitigation and Management Task Force. I'd like to go ahead and call the meeting to order. And Megan, if you don't mind, if you would call the roll. Just a moment. My apologies, there were technical difficulties on this end. Um, Caleb Cage? I'm here. Richard Whitley? Terry Reynolds? Here. Jamie Black? Here. Dave Fogerson? Present. Felicia Gonzalez? Here. Brett Comston? Present. Megan Worth Ranson here. Chris Lake here. Dagny Stapleton here. Wesley Harper here. Mark Pandori here. Kyra Morgan. Lisa Sherrick here. Julia Peak? Here. Melissa Peak Bullock? Here. Melinda Southern? Here. Leslie Mullenkamp? Here. And for the record, Samantha Laddick? Here. Chair, you do have a quorum. Great. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you, Megan. I appreciate it. And thank you, everybody, for being here today. I know we'll have more folks joining us throughout the morning. Uh, I noticed we have a lot of callers in this morning. So uh, we'll go to um, public comment at this time. Um, a reminder that no action may be taken upon a matter raised under this item of the agenda until the matter itself has been specifically included on an agenda as an item upon which action may be taken. Public comments may be limited to two minutes per person at the discretion of the chair, but comments will not be restricted based on viewpoint. Um, because we do not have a physical location for this um, meeting, we have provided dial-in instructions on the agenda. Um, if you have called in, please um, make sure that you press star six to unmute yourself and um, provide your name and your public comment, and then press star six again to mute yourself. Um, I'll note that uh, we have a considerable amount of written public comment that has been provided to you uh, as well. And uh, with that, we will go ahead and open the floor for public comment at this time. I'd like to start on a positive note. Okay, go ahead. Please state your name and provide public comment. Uh, good morning. This is Kimberly Brock. I'm just calling today to express my gratitude towards everyone involved in the approval of the sports directive. I know there are so many happy kids around town excited that they can finally play their sport because all sports restrictions have been lifted. Rest assured. Uh, many youth sports have been ongoing, including a lot with travel. We've had all types of competitions that have occurred in and out of town very safely, and we will continue to do so moving forward. So um, thanks again, Tax Task Force, for listening to our pleas to approve all sports, and especially you, Caleb, thank you. You've all made so many kids very happy. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Good morning, please state your name and go ahead. Uh, my name is Alejandra Delgado, and um, I just want to thank you for listening. Um, I'm calling in behalf of families of incarcerated, uh, including my brother. I know the state has been slowly opening up, so my question was, my concern was, when will visitation to prisons be allowed? Um, I know casinos are now running at 50%, and um, as well as restaurants, so I feel like it is I mean, I miss my brother, so I think it's time for families to be able to see their loved ones in prison. Thank you. 
Thank you, Alejandra. We'll go to the next public comment, please. Hello, this is Mark St. John. Can I go? Go ahead, Mark. Hi, uh, thank you. I wanted to speak on all behalf. And I think most of the callers on this call are our kids and our parents, and they won't be on the call. I'm gonna be thanking you for them. We just wanted to thank you for carving out the time to hear us. Uh, I wish everyone on the task force was able to see just to get a glimpse of the impact you guys made in these kids' lives and how grateful they are and we are. Uh, we still have some hurdles to get through, and this was the first step on us uh, getting back to full contact and having games. So we wanted to thank the task force. Megan, uh, thank you for your emails. And Caleb, thank you for carving out the time and making your team available. Uh, with that, we'll sign off. I think everyone, water polo, you guys can all hang up. But we wanted you to see our numbers. So thank you to the task force. Thank you to Caleb. And Thank you for hearing us out. Uh, have a good rest of the day. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate that. We'll go now to the next public comment. Is there additional public comment at this time? This is Claire Kohatsu. Hi, Claire, go ahead, please. Caleb and the rest of the task force on behalf of basketball and all youth sports, and even right down to neighborhood kids that can now play hoops in the park. We really appreciate your time and consideration and thinking about these kids that need that part of their life back to get back to normalcy, to better mental and physical health really important to them um, as you can imagine when you were a little kid how important sports was to as a part of growing up it teaches them so much and we're really glad to move forward and we really appreciate your time consideration and letting you sports go again thank you so much thank you claire We'll go to the next public comment. As we've said a number of times uh, during these calls and on these meetings, there's a delay between um, our, our uh, Zoom platform and YouTube platform very often. And so wanna make sure there's plenty of time uh, for public commenters to provide a comment and make sure that um, we aren't missing anybody. So I'm going to I'm going to ask one more time and we'll leave it open for about 30 seconds unless uh, somebody else has comments and we'll go from there. So um, is there additional public comment at this time? Okay, with that, thank you everybody for your patience. I just wanna make sure we're providing ample time for members of the public to provide comment. Um, we'll now close out agenda item number two, which is public comment. I wanna remind everybody that agenda item number eight will also be public comment at the end of this meeting. Um, but I'd like to move to agenda item number three, um, which is approval of the task force minutes um, and, uh, We'll open the, the floor for a motion or discussion. Dave Fogers and I move approval. Thanks, Dave. Is there a second? Terry Reynolds, Reynolds, I'll second the motion. Thanks, Director Reynolds. Um, is there any discussion on the motion and second under considerations right now? Consideration right now. Okay, hearing none, we will um, call a vote. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed vote no. Motion passes. Hey, thanks everybody, I appreciate that. And I wanna once again, and I know we do this every week, we've got uh, um, staff support from the Department of Health and Human Services, from the governor's office, from 
um, emergency management and otherwise to bring these meetings together and um, as much time as these meetings take uh, for us to get together on a weekly or every other week basis. Um, we have folks that uh, work really hard to make sure we have everything in place, including um, these minutes, which are significant. So thank you, Megan and Tim and everyone who works so hard to, to make sure those are put together. I think it's an important part of what we do, getting all this on the record. And with that, I will open agenda item number four, and we will go to, uh, I believe, Kyra Morgan to um, provide an update on where we stand with respect to numbers. Thanks, Caleb. I'm just going to give it a second for my slide. Get up. And I'm not sure if everyone while, you're, while we're waiting on that, I know we got a phone line that's open right now and we're getting an echo. So if you're not actively speaking, um, please go ahead and mute yourself. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Kyle. Thank you. Um, if you could just go in to the next slide, um, I guess for the record, Kyra Morgan, state biostatistician with the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, cases are starting to stabilize. Um, over the last two weeks, we saw 197 new cases per day. I would say approximately uh, 200 new cases per day over the last maybe three week period. So we're definitely seeing stabilization there. We're no longer seeing significant declines in daily new cases. The statewide case rate per 100,000 is just above the threshold that we use for the county criteria at 217 per 100,000 residents over the last uh, 30 days. And just for context in the county criteria, uh, we use a threshold of 200. Um, so we're getting pretty close to meeting that mark. Next slide. Testing numbers um, are pretty consistent as well. We're averaging 223 daily new tests per 100,000, um, which is well above the threshold for that criteria, which is set at 100. Our test positivity rate is 4.2%. Uh, we've actually been holding at 4.2% test positivity for four days now, which is also indicative um, that we're hitting some stabilization there. We might not see that um, dip too much lower um, in the future. It, it looks like it's really starting to stabilize. That is below the World Health Organization goal of 5%, and it has been since March 19th. So that's good news. Next slide. Hospitalizations are also stabilizing. Um, we have 273 confirmed and suspected as of the 30th of March. That is the lowest total number of confirmed and suspected hospitalized patients for COVID-19 that we've had in Nevada since the hospital association started tracking these numbers. Next slide. We're averaging three deaths per day right now. Um, that's also just about the best we have done. Uh, we might see this continue to decline a little bit. Um, we haven't, like I said, seen it get much lower than this to date in the pandemic, but we do have vaccinations working on our side now uh, for those vulnerable populations. So we could see a little bit more decline in this trend in the upcoming future. Next slide. Um, here we're looking at a, a really busy screen. So I'll try to go over it a little bit more slowly. Uh, we published a couple new pages on our statewide dashboard um, this week. So here we're looking at vaccination data specifically for Nevada residents. Uh, prior to this week on the dashboard, we were displaying vaccination data that um, for any vaccinations that occurred in Nevada. So we were basing it off of uh, vaccines administered in the state, um, but that those numbers could have included non-Nevada residents. We still have that available on the dashboard, but now we've added this page which is looking specifically at Nevada's resident population. As of the 31st, we had administered over 1.2 million doses of vaccine to Nevada residents, and that equates to 25% of Nevadans having initiated a vaccine and almost 15% being fully vaccinated. Uh, if we consider the population 16 and older, which is the population that's actually approved to receive vaccination, those numbers are now added um, on the left hand side there you'll see two sections of purple text. Um, so those are new additions to the dashboard as well. Um, again, as of the 31st of March, over 32% of that eligible 16 and older population had initiated vaccination and 18% had been fully vaccinated. And then if you go to the next slide, um, this just shows that we do still also provide data on our dashboard related to all vaccines administered in Nevada. Um, it's a little bit less robust just because we've moved those uh, population-based measures um, over to the, to the other tab. But here you can just see total doses 
that we've administered in the state uh, being almost 1.3 million as of the 31st. And then you, again, you could just see on the dashboard the distribution by county if you're interested in that. Uh, over 830,000 individuals uh, initiated vaccination and 477,000 um, have completed vaccination. Next slide. Here we're looking at the test turnaround time. We're still averaging one day statewide, which is great news. Um, there are some pockets that are taking a little bit longer, but nothing too terrible or, or too long. Next slide. And this is just another way of looking at that distribution. Um, so I'm gonna just try to do some math in my head here. 52, so 85% of labs are now being turned around in two days or less, uh, which is great. This number just continues to improve as we see the demand for testing and, and positive cases and transmission go down in the community. Next slide. Here's our county tracker. We've had really good results of the county tracker for the last few weeks. Uh, we've even had some um, portions of time where we haven't had any counties flagged. Right now we do have one county, Lincoln, being flagged for elevated disease transmission. They are not being flagged with a high case rate. They actually have a, a really low case rate, so I'm not actually concerned about Lincoln County, but they're being flagged because they have a high test positivity paired with low testing numbers. And so when we have had conversations in the past about average numbers of tests being conducted per day, um, sometimes that number gets pretty low and, and we're not concerned because it's paired with a low test positivity, meaning even though we're not testing a ton of people, those people aren't coming back positive. So there's really not a demand for more testing. Um, in Lincoln County, we're seeing low testing and it's paired with um, a test positivity rate that's going up again, which implies that they could, they could use some more testing in their community, which is why they're flagged this week. The next uh, four slides, I don't think I need to go over in detail. Um, this just shows the trend over time for those three measures for County Tracker. And then there's a slide there at the end um, that shows a comparison if we excluded our inmate or prisoner population. Um, no significant differences from our, the last update. And so I don't wanna um, waste a ton of time going into detail, but for your reference, those slides are included this week as well. And that's all I have. Thank you very much, Kyra. I appreciate the update. And uh, again, all of the work that goes into um, you and your, uh, from you and your team in putting this, these dashboards together. I, um, I know we were talking earlier this week about um, where we started in all of this, and I'm amazed every day that um, uh, how far we've gotten with respect to, to sharing this data with the public. So thank you for that and, and, uh, and, and continuing to track it, but also um, good news that, that we're, um, you know, where our numbers are right now. I know we had a discussion yesterday on our media call regarding um, what the, um, the, the leveling off means. And, and I think that that is um, at least something that um, we, we expected to happen uh, at some point and our numbers being below, at least our positivity rates being below um, the World Health Cor uh, Organization 5% for, uh, for a couple of weeks now is, is, um, is really great. So we'll continue to monitor that as well. I'd like to see if there are other members of the task force who have any questions, comments, um, concerns regarding um, uh, the information that was just shared. Director Cage, Dave Fogerson. Yeah, go ahead, Chief. I just wanna make the comment because um, back in December, we got the National Guard Division of Emergency Management and Immunization Program together to try to work on a plan for vaccines. And we just made a, a goal that we wanted to be able to immunize 60% of the Nevada population eligible in 180 days. And the data that Kyra has right here shows that we're at 32% at roughly 90 days. And, and when we built that, it was one of those uh, big audacious goals that you're like, I don't know if we can do this or not. And to see that we're halfway there and we're halfway there is a testament to the, the work that our local partners, that uh, the health division is doing with the immunization program and that, uh, the FEMA assistance we're getting is actually working and the National Guard's out there working their butts off for us. And, and it just is kind of a, it really struck me when I saw that slide. So I appreciate actually visualizing that. Kira, thank you very much. Yeah, it's, um, that's extremely important. We have two vaccination updates um, on our uh, agenda today. And I think we're gonna be able to share some important information about um, 
how we got there and how we can improve that going forward. I know, um, I think we would all agree that the, um, the first few months of that, uh, that 90 days, or at least the first half of that 90 days was a rougher start with uh, getting all of the systems in place and a lower allocation. And now we're starting to um, get a higher allocation from the federal government. And, and I think, as you indicated, this is a, this is a really good sign uh, and, and uh, that we're hitting our stride here with, with respect to vaccination rates. So thanks for pointing that out, Dave. Are there other um, comments or um, questions, any, any input on the current situation report? Okay, hearing none, thank you very much. And thank you, Kyra, once again, for you and your team's work on that. I know we got a long way to go um, moving forward. So um, let's go ahead and close out agenda item number four. And um, the, we'll go to agenda item number five, which is a, an update on the roadmap to um, recovery plan and the um, related executive orders. So um, I'll, I'll provide uh, three basic updates on this. I think we, um, we uh, agenda items six and seven are um, I think front of mind for everyone here and some really important information, but I wanna um, go over where we stand on um, the roadmap to recovery. So it's, it's April 1st, um, which uh, in my house is my, my daughter's birthday. So this, none of this will be couched in terms of, um, of April Fools or anything like that. It's a very special day, not a, near, a day for irreverence. Uh, Felicia, I know you you would prefer it to be otherwise. So um, we have uh, two weeks or about two weeks as of right now before we um, start to receive the plans and updates from our local partners, our county partners going forward. And over the last few weeks, um, we have been working um, with them and talking to various groups in order to address concerns and answer questions and so on. Um, there have been a number of questions that have come up um, regarding where we stand and, and what all of this looks like going towards May 1st, a month from now. So what I'd like to do is cover the, the three biggest questions or areas of questions. And uh, Deputy Superintendent Gonzalez, I'll, I'll, um, I'll go to you for the third question um, regarding schools and graduations and all of that. And, and we can have that discussion here in a moment. But uh, the first is um, with respect to uh, events and specific groups that have been, um, or specific groupings of uh, activities that have, um, have uh, been limited uh, due to COVID-19 mitigation measures, as you heard during public comment. Um, we, uh, we've been working with a lot of, um, uh, youth sports organizations, and uh, not just youth, but um, all kinds of different um, amateur and, and um, non-NIAA or the high school, uh, the, 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 the uh, sports programs associated with our, our uh, official um, school programs and trying to find ways to uh, allow them uh, back into the activities that they love, as you heard in public comment in recent meetings um, that are very important to them and very important to uh, their families and their children. And I think we would all agree that um, their public health reasons, their mental and behavioral health reasons, there's all kinds of reasons um, that these things are beneficial. And our goal and our job has been to make sure we're doing it uh, in a way that's that's equitable. So So we're going across the board and we're we're opening things back up that that um, can make a difference and can um, can can have an, uh, can be effectively reopened without um, major risks to our um, public health landscape here, um, and to do so that, that in a way that's responsible as well. And so we've been working on those individually as they've come up. Um, we have a number of those conversations that are ongoing. Um, we always welcome. Um, public comment in these meetings. And one of the reasons I think it's been really important for us to have these task force meetings, especially as regularly as we do, uh, is to ensure that we do have that ability to hear from members of the public um, in a very direct way 
Um, and as you, as you know, many of you are a part of the conversations that follow those uh, public comment meetings where we get together with groups and, and really get to the details and the, the issues. And, and that's resulted in things like um, the um, sports uh, directives that were that was recently released and uh, as well as uh, many of the other things that are going on but that's done in a deliberative way um, where we we get uh, input from groups like the medical advisory team and others in order to make sure uh, that we are um, meeting those uh, meeting all of the needs that are associated with this you'll also note that um, we have uh, directives and announcements regarding um, the vaccination effort and April 5th, as I know we'll talk about in, in items six and seven are really important days for vaccination, really exciting days for the vaccination efforts here in the state. And, um, and, and I know we're excited to learn more. So those are the efforts, uh, the major efforts that we have underway, um, but, uh, but uh, in, in really a general form. Um, in one of the questions that has come up a number of times, so this is the second item um, before we get to you, uh, Deputy Superintendent Gonzalez, the, um, the, the second item that has come up a lot and it came up during the last meeting and that we've had a number of conversations on is um, the current um, directive that's in place right now um, requires uh, or doesn't require, it lays the groundwork, the pathway for return to local control, local authority, on May 1st, as we all know. And our next group, grouping of meetings coming up in the middle of the month will allow us to, um, to, to consult with the local governments, to hear their plans, to offer feedback, um, and uh, to get us closer to that as it comes up one month from now. Um, we, the governor has kept in place in his directive, he's kept in place a number of provisions in order to protect the public um, health in that time. And as we all know, the mask mandate remains in place. Um, the, uh, as Chief Black knows um, better than anyone here, um, organizations like the Gaming Control Board will remain responsible for um, coordinating and, and uh, enforcing and otherwise um, working with um, their licensees and, and Director Reynolds and his uh, agency will continue to work through um, DIR and uh, Division of Industrial Relations and other organizations to make sure that we are um, doing what needs to be done to protect um, the public here. One of the one of the lines in the guidance and in the uh, directive um, that has been the cause for some confusion right now has been um, the requirement that um, the social distancing and hygiene requirements related to or that are introduced through Directive 021, 021 or Directive 21 um, remain in place after May 1st as well. Um, and, I, and I believe um, the, the confusion on that is a very, it's very sincere confusion about what that actually means and what that means for our local partners as they develop their plans um, does that mean that restaurants must meet the social distancing requirements that are outlined in there and um, you know, cosmetology licensees and others that are specifically called out in that? Um, do, they have the, do they have to meet those needs or did that line in the guidance and in the directive mean something different? We've had a number of conversations internally uh, about that and have had ongoing conversations we're continuing to review those requirements right now uh, and to provide um, further input going forward um, and what that means. And I don't want to get down too into the weeds of, of, um, of where we are on that because there's, there are decisions yet to be made. Um, but uh, <clears throat> our goal is to make sure we meet the, uh, the spirit and the letter of the directive going to um, May 1st and local tr transition to local authority on May 1st and make sure that we are giving back as much uh, authority over those requirements uh, as we possibly can and to do so in a way that allows us to continue to protect the public health and public safety in the state. So um, we are uh, reviewing that requirement and, uh, and we'll be issuing some, some clarifying guidance as soon as we possibly can. Uh, my goal is to have it early next week to make sure that we can uh, provide that to um, to local governments. But um, uh, happy to take any questions or or 
have those discussions in the meantime about um, what that requirement of Directive 21 uh, remaining in place actually means and, and what, what pieces of that um, we're thinking. So I think that that's something that's come up a number of times. Um, I wish we had a, a definitive answer for you today. Um, we do not, um, but our goal is to um, get that information to you next week. And our goal is to um, turn those social distancing decisions uh, as far as possible and as much as possible uh, to the local authorities uh, on, on May 1st, um, assuming all of the conditions have been met. And then finally, uh, Deputy Superintendent uh, Gonzalez, if you want to um, uh, ask your question or um, offer any of uh, your perspective that we've been discussing regarding schools. Thank you, Chair Cage. Felicia Gonzalez for the record. Um, so um, as, um, um, as of the release of Directive uh, 41 in Section 14, um, school districts and, and charter schools and private schools may now, um, may now apply for um, large gatherings um, through business and industry. And I'm wondering, um, I'm wondering if this is something that are, are, are we already seeing applications um, and um, making sure that um, if there's anything that I can do on my end to help facilitate any anything um, that I'm here and available. Um, also want to um, to also um, say that um, um, this um, everything this large gathering will also transit transition over to um, to the county as of May May one those decisions move there to making sure that um, that everybody um, is aware that um, that schools school applications will also go to the um, to the um, county officials um, just making sure that um, um, I know that um, the focus of these transition plans hasn't necessarily been about schools, so just want to make sure that um, that's, that that um, everyone is aware that these types of applications for um, graduation ceremonies and other larger events will be coming your way. Caleb, this is Terry Reynolds. Just to uh, let you know, uh, we are we have been uh, approving. Uh, events, graduation events. Uh, we've done several so far and so far so good. We've gotten, you know, great uh, cooperation um, and uh, people are figuring out what to do and, and doing that uh, rather quickly. So that that's a good thing. So we're uh, been doing that. We've also approved uh, open outside graduations for University of Nevada, Reno and the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Um, so that has actually gone very well and, you know, they were well organized and ready to go. And so, and I will tell you that the charter schools and, and other schools in the state are, are doing the same thing. So uh, we're seeing that uh, uh, and we're trying to, we, we, we understand the timelines that they have. So uh, we're trying to be expeditious about that so they can plan and, and uh, tell people, uh, tell the parents and, and relatives uh, when that's coming so that they can be prepared for it. Um, and we're, you know, we're seeing a lot of youth sports um, activities too. So that's also heartening. Um, I think we're probably well, uh, almost at 700 events now that we've uh, approved statewide. So uh, there's a lot um, as Caleb knows, but, but it is going well and we have not had, you know, hardly any, at all, any pushback or anything on guidelines, and everybody is working very diligently to have safe events. So that's uh, very heartening. Thank you, Terry, and and uh, and Felicia for that. Um, Terry, how's your how's your team doing in managing all of this uh, this workload? Well, I, I would say about a week ago um, they were pretty stressed. <laughs> trying to get that done, including myself. Uh, but I will tell you our safety training and consultation team and uh, uh, Victoria uh, Carrion, our administrator, have done an outstanding job in, in uh, going through. And when we have questions, people have been responsive in terms of getting answers back uh, right away, which really helps us. And uh, so uh, we've been able to whittle down. I think we had 
probably 130, 140 events uh, to less than 50 right now that we're reviewing. So um, it has gone fairly well, uh, Caleb. So, uh, and they're doing well. Excellent. Please express our uh, appreciation to them. We know that uh, this this puts a lot of additional work on on their small team, and uh, it's it's really important part of the implementation process. So thank you, Terry. It is. Thank you. To um, Deputy Superintendent um, Gonzalez's point a moment ago, um, this Section 14 of um, Directive 041 um, lays it out pretty clearly. And as you heard from um, Director Reynolds, there is um, uh, there's there's already activity underway. I'm glad to hear uh, you know these 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 groups are motivated. Um, we know that they're motivated because they. They want to get their students, their families, their communities um, back together, and uh, and it's good to hear they're they're attacking it in a in a way that is uh, uh, keeping all of the uh, health considerations in mind as well. So thank you for that update. Are there additional questions or um, concerns or updates regarding where we are in the roadmap to recovery at this time? Caleb, uh, Christopher Lake for the record. I just want to ask uh, probably Terry and make sure that if you approve a plan that's after the May 1st date, that they do not need to uh, resubmit that then to the county that it, the approval carries forward. Uh, good question. This is Terry Reynolds for the record. Uh, that is correct. We've uh, we've talked to the governor's office and, and Caleb's aware of this, that uh, we know that there are events that are in uh, in May and some in the first part of June, uh, and but they need to know now because they need to make preparations for it. So we've been going ahead and approving those events uh, and letting the the county or the um, uh, the entity know that that's happening, uh, so that they are aware of that. So no, they don't have to go back and and reestablish that. Uh, we're also working with. Uh, with gaming, gaming control, and letting them know uh, on events. So, uh, so that you know, we have several that fall in that. Especially graduations, they're going to fall into that uh, category because um, they need to plan for them and need to get the invitations out and and get things going. So, we're we're uh, very aware of that. We don't want them to go through a double process. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Terry. Do we have additional questions or comments uh, regarding where we stand with the, um, well, regarding agenda item number five? Okay, hearing none. Um, I'll just, uh, before we close this out, uh, just so so everybody's aware, uh, Megan worth Ranson on, on our um, uh, task force here has um, provided a, um, an overview, a, uh, um, a timeline is the word I was looking for, a timeline of where uh, we're going to go with our, our meetings going forward. And so Megan, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, no meeting next week and then two meetings the following me week and one week the, the third week, I believe on the 22nd of April in order to, to hear the plans from our, our county partners. Is that right? That's correct. No meeting next week on the 8th, two meetings on April 14th and April 15th, and then um, another meeting on April 22nd. Great, thank you. So really important work to be done over the next few weeks. If you have uh, counties that are reaching out to you or would require a or, or would like additional information or whatever, please don't hesitate to send them over to us. Um, but the conversations we've had are um, including in our meetings in the, the middle of last month have been have been uh, positive and fruitful. And I think we're gonna, we're gonna um, we're going to have some good plans to look over in the, in the two weeks time. So um, with that, I'll close out agenda item number five, and I will go to agenda item number six. And um, Candace, I'll just turn it over to you. Hi there. Thank you, Director Cage. Uh, so I'll just start off by uh, acknowledging and, and really my appreciation for Kyra and her team for doing all of that work to update the dashboard in terms of, you know, additional data. But I think it's really important to see um, those individuals who are actually eligible. So those kiddos who are 16 and 17, and then all the adults and, and what percentage of that population we've gone through. So 
thank you, Kyra, for all your team's work. I know it's a lot of work, but definitely valuable. Um, obviously, working this week, we are, are, are looking at finishing up some of our occupational groups along with those with underlying health conditions, um, most importantly in the pharmacy setting. And so as we look to next week, we are expanding our our, our reach and those individuals who are able to get vaccinated and just really want to support again that um, the patience is still needed uh, as we've started even in the first week of this response. Um, we're never able to get enough vaccine in a week's time to reach an entire either occupational group or general population group. I think what's really encouraging is that we've seen since the beginning of the Biden administration, those incremental increases in, in allocation for the state. And so that's incredibly promising, especially as we work through um, and look towards the future, you know, into the summer. And so um, I think what's what's great with next week and it opening up is that we have a really significant allocation coming next week. We're also working to expand the sites that um, vaccine is available at. So um, within the retail pharmacy program, um, the federal uh, program actually opened up additional pharmacy sites. So we're, we're really looking at additional access points um, that's, that are all supported by federal allocation. So incredibly positive. Um, they all have uh, their, their individual scheduling links that are found on the ndcovidfighter.org webpage. Um, and then we're also obviously supporting allocation through our counties and jurisdictions um, and looking at our private providers. So uh, we are looking at, you know, a family practice that's down the street, but also um, federal allocation is being sent to federally qualified health centers. And then as well as this last week, uh, the uh, dialysis centers actually received a, a allocation straight from the federal government. So um, really encouraging having all these different streams of vaccine coming into the state at different sites. And as we work through the response and we are really supporting more of these mass sites and mass vaccination pods, uh, what we're gonna see happening as we move through the response is increased access at um, maybe in a smaller capacity, right? So it might be um, all of those individuals, individuals we have now, but then we're also looking at um, a lot more community providers and more um, doctor's offices. And so that's something to just really look forward to. Um, and as we go through that particular process, I think one theme that we have always upheld as of the utmost importance is the equity part of this entire response. And so it's always been an underlying um, theme in, in decisions that we make. But I think as we expand those access points and those providers who are able to provide the vaccine, um, we're also going to be able to support um, even an increase in the equitable access. So we're talking about our um, you know, already established community partners who have incredible reach um, into the community to support a, a pod at SI and maybe at a church um, as an example but something that's really community-based. And so we're gonna see this shift going from um, really high efficiency, obviously with really mass pods, but then we're gonna be balancing that with maybe a lower efficient, but far better reach in the communities. And so we're gonna be balancing these things, um, not only at the state level at the immunization program in terms of where allocation is sent, um, but also in you know, all of our counties. And so they'll be working with um, their, their perspective uh, you know, community-based providers and doctors and, and such um, to make sure that those access points are are growing as we go through the response. So I think that's, um, I, I think the biggest um, thing to look forward to as we move through this, also while understanding that the allocation, you know, still that weekly cadence, um, those, those appointments will open up week after week, continue to have that patience. Um, but I think we're, we're at a point now where, um, we are able to expand the access points um, and it's all really positive. Um, but, but just really understand that it's, it's going to be this uh, transitional phase for a little while um, until we get into maybe less mass pods and more community-based events. But Director Cage, happy to, to answer any questions or um, have our other colleagues speak. Yeah, thank you, Candace. I appreciate that. And, and um, I know our our local partners have been just just working night and day with Immunize Nevada and your team in order to get this out. And 
as Dave pointed out earlier, um, the 90 day mark at uh, 32 percent is a big deal. And um, especially with our with our goals and what we're trying to do here. And there are changes every day and there are things that we got to address and challenges and all of those things. But it's really good to hear um, where we are, and where we stand um, with um, moving forward, especially with respect to April 5th. So. Thank you for that update. I'd love to hear from uh, other members of the task force to see if anyone has any um, any questions, comments, uh, anything that ought to be addressed uh, regarding um, the uh, agenda item number six that um, Candace just updated us on. Caleb, this is Julia. I do, um, unrelated to the ad agenda item specifically, I do, do just want to acknowledge Candace. She has um, been promoted and so she'll be moving over to our Division of Welfare and Supportive Services um, as a Deputy Administrator. And so this is her last meeting with us, but I just, all of us, I think um, a collective high five and clap for her. She's done such a phenomenal job uh, leading the vaccination efforts in our state and it's definitely big shoes to fill. So. Um, just our acknowledgement, Candice, for you um, on that. Thank you, Caleb, for the time. Thank you, Julia. I appreciate that. I'll note that in the um, establishing uh, directive for this task force, the governor provides me with the authority for appointments. Um, so I think uh, we'll just keep Candace, uh, we'll just appoint Candace in her new role uh, to this as well. But uh, I'm kidding, of course. Um, in perpetuity, and, right? In perpetuity, <laughs> forever, forever. Uh, Thanks, guys. <laughs> yeah, no, Candace, thank you. Um, and I know you've built a great team there and um, and uh, you'll you'll do great work in, in your new rollover within the, the DHHS family as well. So thank you for saying that, Julia. I didn't I didn't know uh, exactly how public that was. So thank you and, and appreciate you acknowledging her. Director Cage, Dave Fulgerson, I just want to second what Julia said about Candace. She's been an amazing partner that walked into DM and helped us figure out how to help her build that plan and has been with us every step of the process and is a wonderful person, a wonderful partner for this, for our great state. And I'm sad to see her go. And I know all of my staff is sad to see her go from her role and wish her the best in her new role. Thanks, Chief. Thanks, Dave. We have other questions, comments, uh, issues related to where we stand with the vaccination rollout. Um, plan and the efforts that we have going into April 5th. Okay, hearing none, uh, we'll close out agenda item number six and we'll go to agenda item number seven. And um, Heidi, it feels like months since we talked about this, so I apologize. How would you like to, uh, um, would you like to, to tee it up and take it from here? Thanks, Director Cage. I think what we'll do is give a brief overview of the Nevada Vaccine Equity Collaborative, and then we will turn it over to Estepona Group to give a broad view of our um, statewide efforts on communication and outreach. Does that work? Perfect. Thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you, Director Cage and members of the task force for giving us the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, as you remember, which also seems months ago, <laughs> Caleb, um, the governor did uh, talk about an equity initiative and really uh, challenged Nevada with meeting that initiative. And at the same time, um, the CDC uh, vaccine distribution funding that came into Nevada also had some directives in it about vaccine equity with uh, some uh, guidance on the percentage of that funding that really needed to be directed towards those efforts. So in partnership with the Nevada State Immunization Program, um, Immunize Nevada and the Nev Nevada Minority Health and Equity Coalition, we have formed the Nevada Vaccine Equity Collaborative. And so this is a partnership um, it's comprised of a number of members uh, from the public, private, state, community partners. Um, we are really excited about who has joined us so far, and we are continuing um, to add to that collaborative. Um, they have met um, just a couple times, but we also have formed two work groups um, to really drive our efforts towards vaccine distribution um, and ensuring equity there, as well as our communication outreach efforts. Um, so those um, efforts are 
in well on their way. We'll have a toolkit actually available uh, to distribute next week. Um, but I also have here with me today is David Perez. He's our public affairs and uh, community engagement manager. And so David's gonna talk a little bit about some of those efforts in detail and then turn it over to Estepona Group. Hello, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Um, those two work groups that came out of the collaborative, um, one is focused on communications and outreach, and then the second is um, focused on equitable distribution. So for equitable distribution, we provide um, or we collect input from the uh, members of the collaborative, and we um, compile information to see where it is that we can best host some of these pop-up clinics to reach those um, hard-to-reach community members making sure that those clinics are provided with um, language specific information, translators if needed, um, and any special assistance that may be required to access the vaccine. For the second work group, which is communications and outreach, um, they have recently um, collected input and we have created a distribution um, plan for communications. This is a little bit separate from what Estepona Group is doing, but. Um, we understand that when we promote this information, sometimes it has to come from a trusted resource that isn't always a healthcare provider. It could be um, a local community leader, um, a faith leader, or a um, you know sports coach, for example. So being able to collect all of those contacts and put them together and using them as a distribution point when we have this information that has been created by um, either the collaborative or with help from the Estepona group. Um, so we're making really great strides. Our next meeting is um, April 7th. Um, we're more than happy to send out an invite if you would like. Um, and we invite, or if you know of anyone who would like to participate, um, the door is always open. We invite as many people as we can to collect as much input as we can um, from throughout the state. Thank you. And then I'll just add really quick uh, before we turn it over uh, to Candace's point about the importance of these pop-up sites. Um, some of these clinics have already started. A great example is um, an ongoing partnership with Catholic Charities in Southern Nevada um, to service uh, or vaccinate those that are experiencing homelessness. Um, they're seeing great success with the partnership that's been developed to provide those pop-up clinics. And I think it just uh, emphasizes how important bringing vaccine into the community really is. And while they may not be those large numbers that we see at um, these mass clinic sites, we are uh, meeting the goals of those clinics, serving a few hundred each time. And I think that is just key. And as we continue to build up those sites, um, community partners that are interested in working on identifying sites um, also are very welcome to reach out to us and work with our community health workers on uh, providing um, services at those sites and bringing volunteers and vaccinators as well. Um, so now I'm going to turn over to Estepona Group um, and they are going to share uh, the strategy and resources available for our statewide um, outreach campaign. Thank you, Heidi. And thank you, Director Cage and members of the task force for having us today. We are very excited to be here. I'm Chelsea Bryce. I'm an account executive with the Estepona Group. And I've been working closely with Heidi for what feels like forever um, on this campaign um, in partnership with the Nevada Health Response and the Nevada Vaccine Equity Collaborative and other partners of Heidi's. Joining me on the phone today, I have uh, Mickley Byerman, our Vice President of Strategy and Paige Galeoto, our Creative Director. They're going to really dig into the campaign, give you a high level look at the research that went into uh, its development and then go over, you know, all of the fun parts about it and how we hope to engage other communities. So with that, um, Tim, I believe you have our slides if you want. Thank you. And I will turn it over to Mickley Byerman. Good morning. Thank you, Chelsea. And as she mentioned, I'm Mickley Byerman. I'm VP of Strategy for the Estepona Group. To Director Cage and the entire task force, I want to reiterate how grateful we are for being able to share a little bit about these really important outreach efforts. Um, if you could go ahead and please advance the slide. So from the outset, so many agencies and groups in Nevada have a vested interest in these goals here, um, encouraging vaccination against COVID-19 among as many Nevadans as eligible and possible and doing so in an inclusive way that respects um, both our individuality and yet also brings together all of us as 17 counties in Nevada. 
So Immunize Nevada in collaboration with the Nevada Health Response and guidance under guidance from the Vaccine Equity Collaborative are working together here to address this challenge through these outreach efforts that we'll be discussing today. So my goal for the next few minutes is just to give you some very high level insight into the research that it went into informing um, both the phase one and phase two strategies here. Do keep in mind, if you'd like to dig into this a bit more, there's a ton more, and you'll be receiving a copy of this strategy, which offers a lot more detail for you. Um, next slide, please. So for us, research always informs strategy. We're fortunate that in December, the Ad Council, in collaboration with the COVID Collaborative, studied vaccine hesitancy. Um, what they found was that people fall on a continuum. It's um, probably pretty common sense, but what we're talking to then in this is those people in the middle, this wait and see group. And that's what we need to be talking to through our efforts. And that's about 40 to 50% of the population. Next slide, please. They noted that the four key areas that inspired hesitancy among these people surveyed were all primarily rooted in misinformation. And as we all know, um, with today's media landscape, that misinformation can be powerful. So in the early days of our outreach based on this data, and also just because we knew Nevadans would be hungry for information as they were hearing about vaccines that were coming, we knew our goal was to educate. We were able to look at research into vaccine beliefs held by Nevadans performed by the University of Nevada, which showed us that this kind of information was best delivered by trusted healthcare professionals. Next slide, please. Um, so during phase one of this outreach, and that began in about December, we created a website, which is nvcovidfighter.org, and other tools um, like you'll see here outdoors some digital ads, that the goal of these was to drive people to the website for information. And when they get that information, that would in fact break down those hesitancy barriers. So we also created more than 30 short videos featuring Nevada healthcare experts from throughout the state. They range from like 30 seconds to a minute and a half long. And many of them were Spanish speaking and answering um, the common questions that were inspiring some of the hesitancy. And this brings us to phase two. Next slide, please. Um, because as the vaccines have become available, messaging clearly has to evolve from that initial goal of the education to now inspiring people to actually take action and to make appointments. So the research here shows that the powerful messages for that wait and see audience in the middle is rooted in positivity, reminding people of the moments that we're all missing that the pandemic took away from us um, and how the vaccine will protect them and their loved ones and their neighbors and keep everyone safe. And, and what doesn't work um, in that bottom sec section of boxes are messages that kind of imply that getting vaccinated is an obligation or just needs to happen and also references to returning to what quote unquote normal. Um, interestingly, it's kind of important to point out that getting quote back to life resonated, but not a back to normal. So one more note as we think about these messaging um, elements, it's important to add that demographics clearly play a role, a considerable role in skepticism. We learned early from both the research and from the Vaccine Equity Collaborative and talking to community partners throughout the state that messaging needs to show an authentic empathy, um, needs to you know, show this idea that, that, that we're driven by different motivators when choosing vaccination, but that the overall goal here throughout the state is for all Nevadans to be safe and healthy and happy so we can get back to those moments that we've been missing. So again, that was a quick overview, but with all of that as context and um, again, focusing on empathy and inclusion and positivity, the 3 Million Reasons Initiative was born. And at this point, I'm going to turn this over to Paige Galliotto, who will be talking us through what that actually looks like. Hello, I'm Paige Galliotto, and I am the VP of Creative at Estepona Group. Um, and Tim, if you could advance the slide for me. So the 3 Million Reasons Initiative um, was born from all of that research Mickley just went through. Three million is roughly the number of people who live in the state of Nevada and every single one of those people matters. They are the 3 million reasons that we as a state need to unite behind these life-saving COVID-19 vaccines. And beyond the value of protecting individual Nevadans from illness and you know, potential death from this disease, we know that each person has their own individual motivations for wanting to be protected. 
Um, and Nickley alluded to that, you know, we are an individualistic state um, with a lot of uh, different motivators that might in, in, uh, inspire people to want to get back to um, those missed moments. You know, and those range from cheering for their kid at a Friday night football game to gathering with, you know, friends and family at a backyard barbecue or even just simply hugging a friend. Um, we all want to return to these missed moments and COVID vaccination is how we are going to get back to doing those things we love. So basically the theme of this campaign is Nevada has 3 million reasons to unite behind life-saving vaccines and you, the person we're talking to, are one of those reasons. So we are asking Nevadans throughout this campaign, what is your reason? How can we inspire you? Next, next slide, please. So here are just some examples. Um, the beauty of this is that the, the reasons are endless. Um, people's individual motivations are endless. Um, it could be everything from you know, hugging those grandkids that you, have, you weren't able to see in the early days of the pandemic to preserving those cultural traditions and religious traditions like you know, we have Easter coming up. So getting back to doing all those things people miss. Next slide, please. So as we work on all these different communication outreach efforts, we are going to be focusing on messaging best practices. And again, these are rooted in research and rooted in what is proven to be effective in swaying people to make decisions about changing behavior or about doing a behavior, which in this case is the vaccine uptake. We know leading with empathy is vital um, because the goal is to protect all Nevadans. You know, we are not telling Nevadans you have to go do this. We are inspiring or, or striving to inspire them to get a vaccination because it is a decision they have come to on their own. Um, and how are they gonna come to that decision? Well, we know appealing to their desire to protect themselves and those loved ones around them, their family, their neighbors, their friends, that is a motivator. We know that asking influencers throughout the state in different micro communities to deliver these messages is vital. It's not always gonna, and, I, and David touched on this, it doesn't always need or should not always come from the state or a healthcare um, organization. Sometimes it is that church leader. Sometimes it is um, that, as he said, that coach, someone that, you, that um, our target audience can respond to. So recognizing that and also respecting that people still have questions and concerns and that we're not gonna just ignore those and steamroll over them. We're gonna answer them with as much transparency and honesty as, as we can to give people the tools to vaccinate as a decision with confidence. And throughout the campaign, we are gonna be reminding people that the reason they're doing this is to get back to those missed moments and those time um, moments of human connection that they strive to have again. Next slide, please. So in order to support all this messaging and to create consistency throughout the state, we um, have developed um, partner resources and they are available on our website, nvcodefighter.org and um, searchable through the navigation. This is a constantly evolving um, page of the website. We are adding new videos as soon as we develop them. We are updating and adding um, flyers, including vaccine fact sheets that are translated in 10 languages, um, downloadable things like stickers. You know, I got my vaccine stickers and um, social media posts. So lots of resources there um, available to, to any partner. And we also are um, encouraging you that if there is a resource that you feel would be valuable for your community that you um, would like that you're not seeing here, reach out to us. Uh, we are help, you know, happy to help develop that tool for you so that we can maintain that strong branding, that consistent messaging, but give you the tool that you need to to get your, um, your community on board with vaccination. Um, and that outreach could include local media support. We're happy to provide that support to get stories in your local papers um, or even to get coverage of local events. We know that we really wanna promote these positive stories that are gonna help encourage others to um, get a vaccine as well. So if we can do anything to help support that, we're happy to. And when you get the um, outreach guide, there will be a contact um, link at the end of it. Next slide, please. So in this effort to provide you with resources, you know, co-branding is a viable option for anything you might need. We have already done some co-branding and these are a few examples. Um, 
this is a postcard we developed with Nevada Health Response that they could um, provide to their uh, legisl to state legislators as a way to communicate directly with constituents. So it's a postcard that a legislator could send right out to their community um, saying, hey, this is something I, you know, we're supporting and we want you to do. Um, and it's on brand, but also reflects um, Nevada Health Response's brand. Next slide, please. Another example of these co-branded uh, materials are some social media graphics that we developed for Nevada Health Response as well in the Department of um, Health and Human Services. Again, these are consistent with messaging throughout the 3 Million Reasons campaign, but they also reflect the brand um, of the organizations that we are uh, helping promote. Next slide, please. And this final example, actually it's not the final example, but this next example, it's a website header. Um, again, it's a way for the, it was a way for the Department of Health and Human Services right on their website to link people to vaccine resources. It reflects the colors of their brand, but it also reflects the branding of the campaign. So there's not a, a, a disconnect for the, for the viewer. Next slide, please. And another example, um, this is a unique project we did in Southern Nevada. We worked, we um, worked directly with the Mexican consulate in Las Vegas. They wanted to develop a video um, series for their community. They had specific things they felt were really important to say to this community. Among them were concerns about privacy for um, you know, Spanish speakers getting the vaccine um, and immigration concerns. So we developed a series of videos. Again, these are co-branded. Um, high quality videos that they are able to use to help, you know, increase vaccine uptake in that community. So anything um, that isn't available through our partner resource page that you're not seeing out in the community as we roll this campaign out, it is literally rolling out as we speak. So you're going to start seeing all those 3 million reason messages throughout your communities, both urban and rural um, and uh, north and south in every community. If there's something that you would um, benefit from, please feel free to reach out to us. Next slide, please. And in that effort to have consistent messaging across mediums and um, throughout uh, the state, we know that social media is, you know, it's an essential part of the communication strategy. And certainly we are gonna be doing a lot of social media posting, but we encourage all the partners as well to post to engage their communities, to encourage um, vaccine uptake in your communities. We have put together some best practices and that is available in that guide we'll be sending out. And our partner resource page will also be updated with graphics that you can just download right from the page and sample copy as well. So, you know, you can get the messaging out. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, if you need some support, we are happy to provide that. Next slide, please. So speaking about this, this campaign, as I mentioned, it is launching now. Um, this is a list of just some of the initial tactics that we are going to be, um, that we are using. It is gonna be everywhere. It's gonna, it, it's gonna be a highly visible campaign, you know, from outdoor billboards and newspaper ads to digital platforms and streaming and, and broadcast. In addition to those, and David touched on these community out um, grassroots tactics, we know that not every community response to traditional media or some of these uh, digital medias in the same way. And that some communities respond best in a more one-on-one um, -on -one or a more direct way through an influencer. So those grassroots efforts are gonna be supporting all of the paid media to really provide a, a comprehensive approach to educating people about vaccine um, and informing them about how to get them in their community. And now we're just gonna show you a few samples of some of the uh, campaign um, visuals you'll see. So again, outdoor boards are gonna be a big part of it, running north, south, and even in the rural communities. And again, they reflect the individual perspective of anyone viewing this about what might motivate them to get the vaccine. So in this particular case, case our reason, dining out. Um, again, it's, it's, it's one reason, but the reasons are endless and the, and the campaign will reflect all the multitudes of reasons that people might have. Next slide, please. In Las Vegas in particular, bus shelters, um, we're gonna have a heavy buy there. These serve as basically mini outdoor boards um, and they're gonna be all over the city and they're really giving us an opportunity to not only share the reasons and the motivations, but 
using the QR code. Um, it can guide users right to the vaccine website, right to the location finder so they can make their appointments. And <clears throat> next slide, please. And again, just some more samples, some digital ads, again, using um, the various media. Sometimes we are able to target specific communities and customize messaging. So, you know, we can do obviously uh, Spanish language as well as English language. Um, we can guide people to resources that are a little more specific to their particular community and um, can change those messaging on the fly kind of as research dictates or as community need dictates. So that's just a bit of a taste of what's going to be coming your way um, really soon with this campaign. And uh, I'm sure we are available to answer any questions if, if anyone uh, um, has questions for us about this outreach. Thank you all very much. I appreciate the update on both of these, these items, the uh, equity initiative and the outreach campaign. Um, it's really important work. And uh, I know you've, you've had a uh, short runway to get to where you are. And so it's pretty impressive to see uh, the great work that, that's already out there. You talked about co-branding and some of the other things that are going on out there. Um, I wanted to see if um, uh, my questions will be around how our county partners and, and tribal partners and other groups may be able to, um, to benefit from this statewide campaign. Is there a way for them to incorporate their marketing efforts or to, to take this campaign and localize it for themselves? And I know I'm probably getting a lot of the, uh, the, the trade uh, lingo and terminology wrong, but I think you get my point, so. Um, I'll, I'll speak to that, Director Cage. Uh, this is Chelsea Bryce with the Estepona Group. Um, I would say to any community partner, county level, uh, tribal partners, as you mentioned, that is interest that are interested in, you know, integrating um, pieces of this campaign into their specific outreach. Um, if there's not something already on the website that works for you, and you need help getting it um, localized for you, reach out to us um, when Heidi distributes the full guide, um, our contact information will be there, my contact information. So if you're like, oh, I need, I need a logo, or what color is this, or what is this font, or um, how, how would you guys envision us laying out this type of flyer, reach out. We're happy to help. If, if the resource doesn't already exist, um, we're happy to figure out a way to make it work for you. Um, we also know, as David spoke to, that individual communities have unique needs. Um, and unique yeah, placement opportunities in terms of, um, you know, paid and traditional media. So if there's something specific that would work, you know, in Dayton, <laughs> but maybe doesn't make sense in Reno or Vegas, let us know and we'll, we'll find a way to make it work one way or another. Um, we, we want this to be easy for others to adapt and work within. We feel that the consistency and messaging and cohesion is really important for the public to understand a single point of truth and know that the information is valid. So I think working together on this will be, will be key. Hope that answers your question. <laughs> it does, I was struggling to unmute. Thank you, Chelsea. So how would, um, how would somebody uh, reach out to, to um, coordinate with you directly? Do you want them to work through Heidi for that or through, um, well, how, how would they best reach out? I, I would say they could reach out to Heidi or me. We, we talk all the time. So <laughs> one way or another, we're both gonna get looped in. Um, but you know, depending on what your, your request is, if you feel like it makes sense to go to Heidi or me, um, we'll work together to figure it out. Um, you know, it, if, if through our internal conversations, we determine that maybe it's a better uh, fit for David to manage um, as part of the equity collaborative versus a traditional, you know, media outreach. Um, we'll, we'll work it out as a team. We're definitely in contact regularly. So um, myself or Heidi is, is a great place to start and we'll distribute it amongst our teams as needed. Chelsea, uh, this is Heidi Parker. I, I, for the record, I would just add as well to that, um, especially if there's on the ground or those outreach grassroots type of needs, um, then we would 
probably also uh, connect in our community health worker team as yeah. they are in uh, assigned and, and working in all Nevada counties and are able uh, to then really get into uh, those counties and communities uh, to either distribute resources, um, talk with residents, and then also, um, as we mentioned before, assist with those pop-up clinics. So I think we can loop in the appropriate team member from either Immunize Nevada or Estepona Group uh, to get those needs met. I appreciate that. Thank you both Heidi and Chelsea for that. Um, so we have a, a significant presentation here and it was really, um, uh, it was really beneficial for me to see uh, exactly where uh, the creative was going with all of this and um, the background, I appreciate that. I'd like to open it up to other members of the task force to see if uh, anyone else has any um, questions, comments regarding um, this excellent campaign that's underway. Caleb, this is Terry Reynolds. I just want, I um, really totally agree with you. I think this really helps kind of put things in perspective and it's very helpful. Um, I'm wondering if it would be worthwhile once the campaign gets going is to present kind of an overview of the campaign to um, like the school boards, um, uh, county commissions, um, city council people, so they know what's going on in their community. And maybe, I don't know, Dagny may want to comment on that, but I'm trying to think of ways to, to get local, uh, even though you're going to be on, you know, a lot of local media to get uh, some community exposure in areas that um, you may not have. So um, just that's an idea that um, may want to consider. The logistics of that may be too difficult uh, at this point, but it seems to me that would be kind of a good thing to do. I agree, uh, Dagny or uh, any members of the um, team want to respond to that? Yeah, this is Dagny. I'm just thinking about how best to do that. I think the goal is to get the information about the campaign out into the counties, right? So they're aware of what's going on in their communities and anything they need, right? Would that be the goal? Yeah, that was that was what yeah. I was thinking of, Dagny, and that was kind of the, the, the goal, I think. Let me think about how best to do that through my board to get that information out. Um, perhaps it's a brief uh, presentation or just sharing materials. So let me think about how best to do that to my members. And, and if I might add the, the detailed sort of, we've been calling it internally a toolkit, but I, I feel like it's a little bit more than that at this point. Um, it's a you know complete guiding doc that'll be distributed um, by Heidi today or tomorrow. Um, and so whatever questions aren't answered from there, we're available to answer, um, available to hop on calls or join meetings as you guys need to, to share resources, absolutely. Yeah, I think you captured it well uh, in, your, in your question, Terry. It's, uh, I think it's really important, but the logistics need to be um, really finely tuned to make sure it's effective and, and uh, um, the best use of, of everyone's time. I know we have um, uh, Dagny and, and Wesley on here from their respective organizations and uh, Felicia from, from the Department of Education. So if there is, uh, if there is interest, if there is a, a value in doing that, um, I think the toolkit is, a, that's probably a fine name for it. I think it's a, uh, a great place to start and um, uh, we, can, we can certainly coordinate some of that and, and maybe even we wouldn't want to present on your behalf, but we could certainly take some of the coordination load off or, or whatever. So I think we're more than happy to assist with that. And um, uh, please just let us know how you'd like to proceed. This is Mark Pandori, Nevada State Public Health Lab for the record. I had a question about the campaign. And this is a question that revolves around the tactics that you chose to develop it. Um, it, I noticed that the slides were really bent around the ideas of personal benefit and then a benefit to those in your community by getting the vaccine. But what occurs to me is that a, a large part of the issue here is that there's a lot of people that don't believe it works. They believe either that it will harm them or that the variants are rendering it useless. 
if you believed those things, all of the other things in the slides wouldn't matter to someone because they wouldn't necessarily believe that they were going to be protected or that there would be a personal benefit. Or perhaps they might say to themselves, I can do all of those things without the vaccine anyway. So I was wondering if there was some data that you were able to cite or to indicate that led you to choosing this particular tactic rather than one that seeks to establish confidence. I realize that trying to convince people of efficacy is, sounds like a scientific scientific endeavor, but if that's the root problem, I'm concerned that the rest of this doesn't function well as a solution. Thank you. Um, so this is Chelsea Bryce from the Estepona Group, and I'll, I'll start here, but I think Paige and Mickley both might have some thoughts on, on that. But I think one thing to note in, in the campaign is we sort of look at everybody as part of that, like a sales funnel representation. And there's people that are at the top of the funnel who, eh, they know the vaccine's available, they're still not really sure. But then as you move them down that funnel um, towards, you know, the end goal of getting vaccinated, we're going to, our, our goal and our, our strategy is to reach people at certain places in the funnel. So take, for example, the digital advertisements. Those are going to be targeted to, you know, specific hesitancy audiences with specific calls to action, such as learn more versus get vaccinated. So when you're talking to somebody who's hesitant and you're saying, learn how this vaccine can protect you in your community, and then they're clicking on that advertisement and they're landing at a page of information that, you know, talks about the vaccine, that talks about efficacy, that talks about how it's development, how it was developed you know, you're, you're trying to move them down that funnel versus an ad targeted at somebody who is aware of the vaccine and maybe just hasn't figured out the logistics of getting, getting it in their arm. So we're able to really specifically target people, well, you know, based on presumed hesitancy from the national research that was, um, you know, used in this campaign's development. Um, so our hope and goal and strategy hinges, you know, on really being able to reach people where they're at and versus that hesitancy person giving them resources to feel educated about the decision versus giving somebody who's made the decision to get vaccinated the resources to actually make an appointment. Um, Mickley and Paige, I'll, I'll see if either of you have thoughts. Yeah, I think um, I think Chelsea summed it up well. I think also something to bear in mind, um, you know, when Mickley talked about the hesitancy spectrum, we our, our focus is on the movable middle, say the people that, you know, have, a, you know, are, are still thinking about it. If someone is strongly anti-vaccination, we don't presume to think that we're going to change their mind. I mean, it's just, it's just not what kind of, what marketing and outreach is capable of. But for those who are, have a concern, that whole phase one of developing all those education materials, we have all those education materials available so that when people do see our message and they engage on the emotional level of, yeah, that's something I wanna do, but I don't know if vaccine is the way to get back to that. Once they've engaged with the emotionality of the message, and again, that's research driven, that's how we know we engage people is touching on their emotion, not saying, I need to tell you something and educate you, but saying, I wanna help you get back to doing something that you miss doing. Once we've engaged them, you know, we have 35 videos of medical experts and different people talking about why the vaccines are safe, how, why you should trust them, how they were developed. I mean, some of them go into a lot of scientific detail. We know not every person wants to dig in that deep, but we know there are people who do. And maybe they're overwhelmed with going to a CDC website. So we have the resources on our website. We have easy to read fact sheets um, that talk about vaccine safety vaccine development processes. So, you know, if people are engaged with the message, we're providing resources to educate them. And as Chelsea said, if they're further down the funnel and they just kind of want to understand, am I eligible? How do I get it? We have that as well. So that NB COVID fighter website is, um, it's doing a lot of heavy lifting. <laughs> and then part of that engagement also is, as the research suggested, acknowledging the fact that there are people who still have questions and that's perfectly understandable. So really just relating to them on that very personal level of, of saying, you have questions, that's fine. And here are some ways to find answers. And I think the other thing to keep in mind is what you're seeing here are very visual representations of this campaign. Um, obviously the, the high 
kind of splashy, the billboards and the digital ads, but this is multi-pronged and, you know, we will have blog posts from leaders in different communities talking about their personal reasons. And those will be landing pages for different um, digital uh, executions. We'll have stories going out um, through grassroots efforts and also through um, earned media talking about the fact that, you know, people have hesitancy and we understand that and here are some ways to find information. But yes, the, the research definitely says acknowledge concerns and give them a way to find information. And as Paige alluded to, you know, we know that there will be people who we cannot speak to. And at this point, you know, the lowest hanging fruit for us, the best return, the most engaging thing is, is to get to that movable middle, those 40 to 50% of the people who have questions and just need some more information or need to be reminded of those emotional moments that we need to all get back to. Chelsea, uh, I'd also like to add a couple of things. So on the grassroots level, you know, I think Dr. Pandori, that's where we're able, as we are scheduling these pop-up clinics, we can come in and do some pre-education with the community. So helping understand what those concerns are ahead of time, making sure that we have the resources available. And then so that they, by the time that pop-up clinic does come and they can make an appointment, then they do have that confidence. And so we've addressed uh, some of those concerns. Um, I think some of your work with the variants and some of the things we're seeing, I think could be really helpful to us as we move through uh, this campaign. Um, this is obviously we're not um, necessarily on a sprint here. <laughs> we are, this is a long, uh, long go uh, moving forward campaign, I think for months ahead. And we know that. And so I think having input from you and other task force members is going to be really key, you know, as we do move through this, because um, as we've obviously seen over the last few months, things are always fast changing. And um, I think the development of this campaign and the way that we um, have done that really lends uh, the ability to um, pivot uh, and, and do the things we might need to do as, as this develops. And so I think engaging you along with the task force members will be key for that. Yep. Thank you very much. Uh, my, my only comment, I agree with everything that you said. I thought there were co cogent arguments for the strategy. Um, I, I just felt that, you, and I like the point that there's probably a group of people that you can't reach. They don't believe in the principle of the of vaccination, and there's a hard middle to that that you can't crack. And um, I just felt, you know, one of the things, and this is somewhat anecdotal, but I think you could probably find data on it too, if you looked, um, is that, that sphere expanded with this vaccine because of the speed by which it was developed and, and the nature of the vaccine itself. And you know, a lot of people I know who aren't at hardcore actually were skeptical of this, but those people might be in that middle that you're talking about and that the, the nudge on the other side would, would, would work for them. And uh, so I appreciate that. Thank you. It's a really valuable question, Dr. Pandori. I appreciate that. And, and Heidi, thank you for the offer um, I think people like um, Dr. Pandori, who live in the research and scientific side of this on a daily basis, um, could could provide some input, and and we have uh, you know our public health professionals here on this group that that could support as well. So um, I, I really appreciate uh, all of this, and it's a it's a sharp campaign, and from a, a non. Um, uh, communications person, um, the idea of, of really um, getting the, the different layers and different levels of outreach and communication from the grassroots level and earned and unearned and all of those pieces, I think is a really smart way to go about doing this to, uh, as you said, to, to really move the needle the most we possibly can, the, the fastest we possibly can. So um, I'd like to thank you for being here today and um, for all of your great work on this and let you know that as a resource, we are all here, um, except Candace, uh, who is uh, leaving the vaccine community here as of Monday, but the rest of us here are, are committed to the, to the effort. So um, thank you all for what you do. And I don't even know if Candace is on anymore, but I had to take the, the cheap shot while I could. So there she is. Um, do we have any, any other um, questions or comments for either um, Heidi and her team or the Estefana group and their team 
uh, regarding any of these efforts that are underway right now. Okay, great. Um, well, we will, um, <clears throat> at the very least, we'll, excuse me. At the very least, we'll, uh, we'll follow up to everybody and get some of this um, information through the website distributed, the toolkit and otherwise. And if there are opportunities for us to get the word out to our uh, local or district partners, we'll, we'll certainly facilitate that as well. So. Um, Heidi, that looks like it. And Chelsea, thank you for all of your work in putting this together and to everybody at the um, Estefana Group for, for all of this uh, presentation today. Thank you very much. Great. So with that, we will um, close out agenda item number seven and we will go to agenda item number eight, which is again, public comment. No action may be taken upon a matter raised under this item of the agenda until the matter itself has been specifically included on an agenda as an item upon which action may be taken. Public comments may be limited to two minutes per person at the discretion of the chair. Comments will not be restricted based on viewpoint. Um, please follow the call instru instructions that are provided on the agenda. And at this time, uh, we will open the floor to public comment. As usual, I'll leave this open for a little bit longer to make sure we are um, in line with our YouTube. YouTube does have public comment showing as well. We'll wait just a little bit longer. Okay, hearing no public comment, we will close out agenda item number eight and we will go to agenda item number nine. Is there a motion to adjourn? A forward and so moved. Thank you, Dave. Is there a second? Felicia Gonzalez, second. Thank you, Felicia. All those in favor, is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you, everybody. We'll see you in a few weeks.